Hello. Hi, everyone. Uh, Malobi Achuke. So at 12 years old, my family moved across the world from Africa to Asia. I didn't know it at the time, but this would be the single most defining moment of my life. And um, it was in that foreign land in Asia that I first encountered cultures I didn't understand, cuisines I knew nothing about, and religions that fascinated me. And, um, and religions that fascinated me. And at school was actually the first time that I experienced what it was like to be perceived as an outsider. And although we were children, we learned to lean into our differences, uh, thriving together and building bonds that endure till this day. Now I'm telling you this story because on the foundational level, this is the story of diversity, equity, and inclusion work. And it's this story that's ultimately the impetus of me starting the business diversity uh, DEI directive. I bring to my role as CEO my years, as an, uh, of a, uh, my years of experience as an attorney in private practice, as well as business development experts selling B2B in legal tech. My uh, developer, Amer, also has a strong personal experience and brings a wealth of technical knowledge with over 20 years in software development. Now that you know a little bit about us, let me tell you about the problem we're trying to solve. So this is a 2021 study that shows the demographic breakdown up a corporate ladder. Notice that men and women are entering the workforce at relatively similar rates. Their promotion rates, though, not so similar. At the highest levels, white men make up 62% of the workforce, white employees 82%, and all others just 17%. This despite persons of color constituting 42% of the US population and white men just 29%. Now this problem is so pervasive that a Gartner research recently revealed that 80% of organizations ranked themselves as ineffective at developing a diverse and inclusive leadership bench. That's shocking, right? And, um, to make things worse, these failures are actually costing organizations because they fail to tap into the immense benefits of having a diverse workforce, of which there are quite a bit. And um, the main uh, reason for this actually is the lack of data, right? So organizations are attempting to tackle a systemic issue with very little data and even less insight. And that's where we're coming. So at DEI Directive, our approach is to center the data in order to center the people. We believe that tracking initiates change, and so we help organizations collect, standardize, and center their DEI data in one place for a holistic view and data-driven action. Our business intelligence uh, software allows diversity and human resource professionals to access data that is often maintained in silos within and outside the organization. It helps them also to assess their DEI health, as well as benchmark against competitors, industry, state, national averages, and just generally to assess progress of efforts over time. Um, actually, let me go back a little bit. Um, in addition to those features, our learning and compliance feature, as well as our suite of services all the way on the right side, you know, with all of those combined, we truly help organizations navigate a wide spectrum of their DEI challenges. Our business model is a hybrid one. Our software specifically is offered on a SaaS model at $100 per user per month. Um, and when it comes to competitive landscape, our biggest competitors are Workday and Gartner, but not quite. Those organizations offer a human resource management and strategic research systems, which with some DEI components. So they're not quite in the DEI space. And when you're looking at Catalyst, uh, they focus on gender diversity and McKinsey and Company is more a consulting firm. So complete with a completely different business model. 
The U.S. market alone is made up of 27 million organizations, 170,000 of which are required to report diversity data to the government yearly. And none of these, and nobody, these uh, organizations desperately need a concentrated DEI database, and nobody is actively and fully supporting those needs today. To bring this product to market, we are leveraging strategic partnerships. We're also uh, leaning on social media a lot to establish our brand and grow it. And lastly, we, um, I, I just want to say that you know, we believe that we've identified a huge problem here and we have great solutions. Um, I believe that our software will grow to become an industry reference tool for how you achieve excellence through diversity. And today we're asking you to participate in a $120,000 raise, which we'll use mostly to build out the product and to also do a huge sales and marketing push. And uh, with that, I say thank you very much for your time. Um, well, I'd say, I mean, you crushed the setup, right? Mm -hmm. Like yeah. I think we couldn't get past that point without fully kind of grasping the problem at hand, the gap, et cetera. Um, you might argue that you had too many slides in the setup, right? Mm -hmm. But that's nitpicking. But I, in the end, I left fully understanding the issue that you wanted to solve. Um, I had a little bit, like I needed, I probably needed a little bit more of a tie-in of exactly why data was the gap, right? Um, I started to get it a little bit further on about the gap of how it fits into like reporting or et cetera. Um, but that tie wasn't a meet, like when, when we got to the like data's the problem, I was kind of like, oh, really? And I wrote down like, I'm not sure, how do I understand that? Um, you know, I think, you know, again, from a presentation, you know, you were, you were visual heavy over word heavy and like this, this fit that, that sort of element. I, again, I, I, you know, I think um, one of the questions that I have is what, for, so 120, like, is that enough? Like, I, you know, I think that that struck me again as a little bit light. You found, I found it to where you, you clearly have a vision, you know what you want to build, you, there's all these companies that are out there. I, I'd argue a little bit with your competitive set only because I looked at a couple of DEI software solutions this year, so I sh shockingly know a little bit about that space. And um, so, but, but from your description, it's like, there's all these huge companies, they have this gigantic problem and no one's solving it. That is the perfect venture thing, which is, let me give you a bunch of money so you can go grab market share in this untapped. So, so where's, how, how did you get to 120? Why not more? Yeah. So the 120 is really just, it, it's reflective of um, what our next goals are, which is to complete the software and actually bring it to market. So that's what that is. Um, so that would be the amount that we would need to do that, as well as the amount that we would need to, you know, kick off like some marketing and sales. Yeah. Okay. But we would absolutely go into further rounds to raise more. So have, yeah. Having been around a lot of companies, that doesn't sound like nearly enough. Right? I, I, I'm sure there's a budget somewhere that that's where the total, like, that just, that sounds like you'll get into it and you'll find out that that's not nearly enough. And I think milestone-driven fundraising is clearly where it's at. The one sleight of hand trick that investors do is... They ask for the same amount of your company, regardless of how much you ask for. That's right. Right? So you ask for 250, I want 10% of your company. You ask for 120, I want 10% of your company. Right? It's like everyone pegs to this ownership stake. And so you, you find yourself like, if you don't ask for the right amount, you'll find yourself giving away the same amount of your company for that, and you might have been able to get a better pricing. Right. Um, in the end, People, the way people underwrite is outcomes. So it's like, can this be a huge outcome? Well, I want to own 10%. They're not as like, oh, it's 50K for 10%? No, I don't want that. It's, you know, yeah. so it's, in the end. It's not like yeah. if you cut it to 110, they'd go like, oh, that's so much better of a deal, yeah. right? And it's not like if you said 250, that people start ruling themselves out. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I think anything 250 and below, honestly, is the same person. Yeah. And they're indifferent to that. You'd be shocked how indifferent people right. are to money at that yeah. stage. So yeah. <laughs> I thought you did great. Could you go back to the pricing slide? Yeah. And, and by the way, y'all, like, I mean, her materials are kind of different, right? I mean, like, th these are really good materials. That first, the McKinsey chart you showed, that's like, yeah. it's like, wow. Yeah. Holy cow, that's like, 
you know, I didn't know that. So my question to you is, is, is really simple. Um, can a company have one user and get value from what you do? Or do they need to have multiple users in order to give value from what you do? So, I mean, they could have one user, but they would obviously get more value with multiple users. So our product is actually an enterprise product. However, it doesn't have to be. You could have it be something that is adopted by you know, diversity departments or human resource departments alone. But I think to really enjoy the full breadth of you know, the advantages of having the product, it would need to be more widely adopted. So like for a typical company, because like, you know, comes with DEI initiatives tend to be larger, right? They tend to have sort of a hierarchy and a bureaucracy and all that. When you think about licensing a customer, right? Like how many seats are you imagining like in a deal? Like what's in your mind, what's a deal going to be? So um, typically our target customers are really organizations from, you know, 50 employees and more. At that point, that's when they're really caring and they have all those different hierarchies. And so within that company, a minimum of five to 10 licenses is really the target. Because okay. like, if you're talking about, because what I was thinking about while you were talking about this is like, um, your product, like your presentation is good, and I feel like the need that you articulated is a real need, right? I share Chris's thing, like if you more tightly connected the data thing as a solution, that'd be helpful, right? But when I looked at that and I thought, okay, you know, you're gonna go acquire customers and they're gonna be worth $1,200 a year, right? That's a hard way to make a living. 1200 bucks is not enough, right? Now, $12,000 a year from a customer, that can be a viable SaaS business. Right? And so I would, I would really think about, as you present this, sculpt, like really communicating that you're thinking about five-digit annual customer value, right? Or six-digit yeah, annual customer yeah. value, right? Because you could, at some of these big companies, like you could be charging them 10 grand a month, yeah. right? And those are the people that you really want to go get, yeah. right? Um, so my next question was this, is if somebody signs up, right, and they start using your software, what benefit would they see? How, what would change for them in mm -hmm. the first six months, right? Because when our, our company, right, when somebody licenses our software, because we sell licensed software, right, typically they see their revenue increase by about 21% by in about the third month. That's a big deal, right? What benefit can you articulate for one of these companies when they license your software? So the biggest challenge with a lot of organizations is the way organizations are currently tracking this actually varies from organization to organization, and there's a lot of dysfunction in the way it's done. Um, you have different departments having, you know, spreadsheets or, you know, maybe just on a Word document or in an email exchange format. So there is no uh, standardization and there's definitely no centralization. So one of the things we do is not just providing you an avenue to be able to do that, but is also identifying the types of metrics that you need to track because that's also often where the struggle is. Is people don't, what, people don't know what the metrics should exactly. be. Exactly. Yeah, they don't know what they should be tracking, right? Um, do, because do you think you know what the metrics are? Absolutely. Absolutely. You do. Yeah. Right. So I mean if you're looking at an organization, right, sometimes organizations will report their DEI breakdown and they're looking at it, you know, on an organizational level because that story is a little better. But once you again like the McKenzie slide, once you go up that ladder, then it's bad, right? And so that's not necessarily a success story. You're succeeding in one front, but there's still a major issue because there's still, um, there's still like a, a problem or challenges with people ascending within the organization, regardless of yeah. merits and you know, experience yeah. and you know, performance. So, so I'm sure that you've heard about vitamins and painkillers, right? Because yeah. like, like we sell a vitamin, like we sell a vitamin. There's painkiller elements to it too, but like you use our thing, things get better, right? I think that for you, selling to large corporations, right? If you can communicate metrics that will make them believe that they could reduce their risk, right? That is a great place to start in terms of motivating them to go. Because if you can say, look, Chris, you've got unexamined risk in your business that you're not even measuring. I'd be like, oh no, I, I hope you're wrong, right? But like, but like, tell me more because if you can articulate those metrics and make me as a prospective buyer think, I'm not measuring that. Yeah, right? I think, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I'd go, the way we often describe it is, hey, if you're selling a software solution in, can you, can you tangible um, and objectively measure an ROI to someone? If it's like, well, you 
hire better and you'd become more innovative or whatever, yeah. that's a tough sell, right? That, that requires a champion, that requires someone who's like leading a cause. Those people leave over time and then those things get ripped out. Or, but if you can say, I do this, you save money or generate revenue in the following way, whether that's, hey, did you know you're spending $5 million a year in like risk and out, whatever, right? Can you go to to be chart? able to quantify yeah. that is yeah, really go, helpful. Go, go to the people. chart with the check marks. Can you, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. That one, like, like that thing. Like, it, it, I think your metrics are buried in there somewhere, right? They are. Yeah. And, yeah, yeah. And so, like, I think if you can say, look, you know, Bank of America, you go do this, right? Higher financial performance is going to manifest itself as X, right? right. Or, you know, employee engage, retention. retention, that yeah. kind of stuff. Right, and the risk mitigation, man, big companies are afraid. And like, if you make them, if you make them aware of risks they're not measuring, a lot of times they'll react. I, like one thing I would encourage you to do is um, just in the aftermath of uh, the internet tech bubble of like 2001, Congress did this law called Sarbanes-Oxley, right? Mm -hmm. And Sarbanes-Oxley spawned a whole bunch of software companies that helped companies ostensibly manage risk and increase compliance, right? Um, I personally would argue that it hasn't done very much <laughs> to actually affect that, but holy cow, a lot people of people made a sold, lot of money. People sold a lot of software, <laughs> right? And this made me think of that because they sold it really based on fear, right? And like, I would look at the companies that have done well with SOX compliance software and see like, how are they marketing? To whom are they selling? What are their messages? Because there may be echoes of those things that you can mimic to help people get that they should buy your software. Yeah. It was good. You're an awesome presenter. And too, I yeah. think as far, you know, one of the things with retention that's interesting is like, you know, your diversity problems may be retention oriented, right? But today, are you segmenting your code? Like you have probably a, you know how many employees turn every year, right? You know that at a globalized level and how many you hire. Do you know if it's 2X, if you're black or brown, right? Do you know that, do you know who's turning, right? And can you spot a cultural issue, which is, is your DEI problem not that you have lack of qualified candidates, it's that they get here and they don't like your culture, right? Or they don't feel like part of this team or they feel alienated or whatever it is, right? And they're turning over at a higher rate. I think that's where I can tie that data, which is, yeah. hey, you know things about your, you know things about your uh, employees, but you don't, you can't measure the thing, things that matter at a granular level until you have this type of data. That's so, it, yeah. That's it. You hit the nail right on the head um, because a lot of companies, what they do is they turn to recruiting. That's also important, but if you're churning employees, okay. that doesn't do much for your reputation and you would never fix the problem well, because they're leaving us. Exactly. Because if you're trying to, if you're trying, if these people are churning much faster, and you're already poorly set up yeah. to like recruit them, you're probably spending more on employee acquisition in that chance. So like you're double-edged shorting it, yeah. which is, you know, you're, you're using the wrong things to solve that problem, yeah. so uh, yeah. Yeah, you're great. And, and I do want to emphasize that this is for both of you, really like ask for more money. Like, I mean, like don't negotiate with, with yourself before you even go into the room. Ask for a lot more money. Like I think you need to ask for two or three times more money. You need to ask for eight times more money, right? <laughs> Seriously, because cause like it, it doesn't feel like you have a good enough grasp on what you're gonna need to build the business if you're asking for not enough money, yeah. right? And like, sort of imagine if someone said, hey look, you know, I'm gonna drive to Atlanta and what I wanna get from you is an eighth of a tank of gas so I can get to Greenville and then I'm gonna figure it out. You go, dude, just, I'll give you a whole tank of gas, right? You know, right, yeah, 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 so, yeah, it's good. They're a great presentation, it was good, yeah. thanks. Good, yeah.